So this lecture is on coding, meaning the letters you type into your text scripts. So before even getting there, it's just like managing code, coded as many files. So this goes without saying, I'll just go quickly. You need to come up with a good scheme for yourself. How do, where do you put your code? Do you put it in folders? What name you give them? You know, the example scripts I prepared, I named this way, which I thought was reasonable. Uh, you gotta develop a workflow for yourself. And you know, once you get to the point of making figures for papers, there's a whole slew of pipeline or like a whole series of steps that got you there and hopefully you kept track of what that all was. Um, yep. Uh, it kind of means like, you know, if you were to rerun, yeah, think about it that way. If you have to redo everything from the original raw files, what series of commands or scripts or functions or whatever would you have to do? And do you know what they are? Um, some people say, I mean, you will hear this of like, oh, can we like develop code to the point of like push go and then it will reproduce everything? You know, and ideally, yeah, but in practice, that's insanity because especially for huge fMRI data sets, like, well, you're going to redo free surfer, you're going to redo motion correction, you're going to redo, you know, all of that. So that is a nice ideal, but is impractical. But you can imagine, okay, let's divide the analysis into pre-processing and then actual analysis. So maybe you'll take the data up to the pre-process point and then imagine you can have a single button, single script that you can run to take you to your figure. That becomes more manageable. Uh, GitHub, I'm sure you've heard of, um, you might consider using it. It forces you to keep a history of what you do and check things in and things like that. Um, and then one little minor note, we saw one, one t uh, flavor of this in one of the example scripts, I'll, I'll just remind you. Um, oftentimes you wanna do things multiple ways. So for example, uh, in the behavioral data script, I think, no. Sorry, one of the scripts shuffled, but which one was it? Sorry. So the issue is, oh, here we go. So all that work just to find this line. So, but often you wanna do an analysis two different ways. And so one route is like copy and paste an entire section of code and then tweak like a few lines so that you can get it to run the first way and then get it to run the second way. Or you can copy and paste the whole thing into a whole new file and then save it as a different file. Generally speaking, that's a bad idea because then you just have too many lines of code and it's, it'll grow out of control. So in this little script, we had an example, let me just zoom in. Um, you basically put it in a for loop. And so you reuse code and the only thing that changes is like a line or two. So in this little, this was a visualization actually. So I had, oh no, it wasn't a visualization, it was analysis. So I had two versions I wanted to generate. This was um, uh, just kind of plotting beta weights. And um, I just had a for loop over the two versions. And so it basically the for loops share almost exactly the same code except for one line. So that line was right here, there's a switch statement. So switch means like, if ver is one, then do this, or if ver is two, do this. So the only difference was, shuffling or not. So the first version was actually get the trials corresponding to that image. And the second one was shuffle, destroy all the order in the beta weights and show me what it would look like if there was essentially no signal, that, that idea. Anyway, so it's just one line that is different. 
And so instead of copying and pasting 20 lines, I really just have to spend a few lines here and then like the for loop line. And then that keeps your code nice and tight. But again, none of this is ever like always do it that way because sometimes that also grows out of control. If you have 10 ways to do it and you start making your single script 10 times as long, so you, you have to just decide for yourself when, when, when does it make sense to split off or when does it make sense to keep it together. Okay, uh, moving on. Um, this is according to me what uh, dimensions along code might vary. So how much to comment it, obviously, and it, I think it should depend on what you intend, who intends to read it. Is it just yourself? Is it to teach someone something, which is kind of what these scripts are? Or is it to release a toolbox that other people will read? So the level of commenting will depend on the intended use. Flexibility, basically does the code only do one thing and it's hard coded to do that one thing or do you actually wanna potentially use it for other data sets? Another dimension is like efficiency, which is like time, computer time. So is it really important that the code is really fast or is it like such small data that it doesn't matter if it's inefficient code? Um, reusability, this is kind of like flexibility. Um, I guess, let me, let me give you an example of what the difference between flexibility and reusability. So if you write a function, the very fact that you make it a function implies you're gonna reuse it. Like you have a function that like computes Pearson's correlation, like the thing I showed a second ago. I use that function all the time. And it's like significant amount of code. So I decided one day to say, okay, let's make that into a function. And then I can just easily in one call to that function do that operation in many different scenarios. Uh, re, uh, flexibility, let's look at um, these scripts. So let's just look at this um, MBPA script. So the way I designed this script, it's, it's kind of flexible. So like all these constants up here imply that if I were to just tweak one of them, like the number of sessions, it would just work. And that was a design decision. Like I wanted it to be flexible, so I set it up so that I put these constants at the top and ensured that the code below it was totally happy to work no matter what that constant was. However, it comes, not everything is com completely flexible. So like the image annotations I was using, I, you know, that's a file and like A1 has certain variables in it. I think it's counts or something like that was not generalized. Like it looks for count val. That's not like a general thing. Like what if I wanna pull annotations from somewhere else? this script will fail and you'll have to adapt it. So it's flexible up to a point, basically. Um, modular, I mean, some of these terms kind of mean the same thing. Well, here I just mean like functions, I guess. Uh, concision, hmm, this one's a hard one. So let me give you an example of what conciseness means. So in, in some of the lines of the code um, that I provided, um, let me highlight, uh, yeah, so this guy. So indexing <laughs> can get very hairy. So here I decided to put several levels of indexing on one line. So the advantage is it's concise. It's just one line of code and like your eyeball can just be like, oh yeah, that's fine. Versus you can split this into many lines. This could take like four lines to do. So whether you use one line or four lines, that's a choice. Like four lines might be clearer to you if you read it, but it's four lines of code versus just one line. So, and you know, this comes up all the time. Like here I permute and also cast the single on the same line. So first I take the data, reorder the dimensions, and then I cast, and it just makes it nice and short. Um, for the most part, I, I, I like concise code and I, I'm happy to string function, 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 function. You probably saw that somewhere in this, these scripts. Um, but it's a choice. Yeah, I'm just looking, is there another example of stringing together? Oh, and then here's the reverse. I could have strung those lines together, but these are like super critical lines, each with their own comment. So I decided to make this super clear, because it's like, if this breaks, everything will break. I decided to split it into many lines. 
and comment it. So design your code well. Uh, last bit here, oh no, two last ones. Readability, oh it is the last one, yeah. Uh, obviously you should indent your code and comment it and uh, use good variable names, things like that. Just so that, I mean code is always hard to read but don't make it harder on yourself or other people. So these are, you know, general abstract principles and it's hard to learn until you just do it for a long time. Um, some thoughts that come to mind regarding like programming practice, some of this we've already mentioned, hard coding. So let's just give a concrete example. What does it mean to hard code? So I put these things at the top of the script because, well, it's easy and you don't want to have to dig to find where in the body of the code these, these simple constants are. So don't, general, try to avoid hard coding, define your stuff at the top. I think that's pretty straightforward, everyone. Um, we already mentioned this, segregate your code into stages, load versus analysis versus visualization. Um, this has the benefit of, and then we'll get to this in the next couple slides, like how do you know if your code's working? Well, it's hard to hold 100 lines of code in your head at once, but you can hold like 20 lines of code. So if you chunk your code, then you can like vet that part, vet the next part, vet the next part. And an example of this is, and I think I said this verbally yesterday, don't worry about like visualization. You can always tweak that later. Just focus on the analysis. Uh, another kind of good principle to, follow, which I actually didn't follow in the script all the time, but I can tell you why, which is initialize and pre-allocate your variables. So one benefit of this, so like, I know that betas will eventually be voxels by trials. So just by stating this and writing this, you're conveying to yourself, oh yeah, this is eventually gonna be that size, that, that's helpful. Um, I was gonna say, but it's no longer true. So. Even if you don't define a variable, so A, I just cleared, so A doesn't exist. So for whatever reason, someone decided that it's okay to go ahead and assign to A, even though it doesn't exist. So it doesn't crash, in other words. You know, it's risky, I guess. It, whoever designed the programming language could have decided crash on this, like enforce that you must allocate that variable before you assign to it. So MATLAB but, does not crash. So that, you know, it's nice, because you don't have to like, worry too much about allocation, but it's risky because stuff might, you know, if you thought betas was trials by voxels, and then some of your code was assuming that, and it was supposed to be voxels by trial, like it would not crash and that's risky because you would have two different interpretations. You thought it was this, but you were coding for that. It would be safer to crash if you try to access trial, you know, a thousand when it was actually in the row dimension. But anyway, so MATLAB will not, generally crash on assignment, but it will crash on getting. So if I try to get the 10th element, it will crash. So that's when you know something's wrong, but you won't know on assignment. Yeah, so there's efficiency. Yeah, sorry, I forgot about to mention that. Yeah, um, I think lately MATLAB has gotten smart about it somehow. So what Diego's saying is basically if you don't really pre-allocate and just set A to be empty and start increasing it, there could be a co time cost or slash memory creation cost. Um, so one, but I think lately they've kind of somehow magically gotten around that. I see. Oh yeah, the little mlint stuff. It starts like. <laughs> this is easy. We we can do a test. All right, tick. A is that. Let's start doing some computation. And let's just set A to rand. Talk. Okay. So, in a for loop, do ten thousand random numbers without pre-out. Oh, that's too fast. 
50,000. What? Come on. Um, what do I do? Really? Okay, that, that's significant. Okay, so this was, you know, this is not, this is initializing but not pre-allocating. We initialize in the sense that it exists, but we didn't allocate memory for it yet. It's just empty. So the, the flip would be, or the reverse would be pre-allocate this thing. So set it to be, what is that, 5 million? There you go. But then just do the same thing. And better code, by the way, would be this. You don't want to type a number twice. Just look up the length of that vector and do it. Okay, so if we run that, so this is with, oh, our test was bad. So tick tocking this means measure the time to do this, all of this. Um, here, there's a cost to actually doing the pre-allocation, but I was just curious, when you expand the matrix size, is that costly? So let me redo this with the tick around the, just the for loop. Okay, so in the first case, it's empty and then we make it big and it takes about 1.1 second. And then in the second case, we actually pre-allocated all that memory. Ah, there is a speed hit when you don't declare how big it's gonna get because every time you put another thing in, it's like, oops, gotta get more memory. Whereas in the second case, it, it doesn't have to do that. So that's a threefold, threefold uh, speed up. Yeah, obvious, use good variable names. Oh, practice safe programming. So we're gonna have a few slides on that. So this is according to me, like some basic, basic things to try to internalize. Question. Everyone has their own style. I hate capital letters. I don't know. I don't like underscores either. But I don't know. I mean, that's totally. A bad one is a long one because it takes time to type. I don't know. And a bad one is one that's obscure, like gobbledygook. I don't know. Let's see what the kind of variable names I used here. Num to do data Z. Oh, yeah, sometimes I use capital. H. I don't know. Just develop a style, I guess. IX for index. P. By the way, P, little variables are very risky because if you reuse P, inside of a for loop that already is using P, it's gonna cause major confusion. So it's, be careful. Yeah. Yep, loops within loops within loops, you sort of lose track of what's going on. But on the other hand, as we said, like big data is gonna make you do loops, loop over subjects, because there's, Oh, you uppercase your functions. Yeah. So, yeah. Do I Okay, so um, this is some of this is pretty obvious. So deciding when to make a function is a choice. So basically it's a choice of your time. So to write a good function takes time, but if you're never gonna reuse it, it's wasted time. But on the other hand, if you are gonna use it a lot, spend the hour or half an hour to make it because it'll save you lots of time in the future. Um, and then especially if it's a function you're gonna use again and again, make sure it's right. Like don't, you're gonna build a foundation of cards that fall once you realize there's a bug. 
Um, as for scripts, you know, it, it kind of depends on what, like if it's just exploration code, you don't have to spend a lot of time making it pretty. And often I don't even comment like one off code snippets. I'm just like, playing around. Um, but you know, once it becomes like a real piece of analysis that you're going to rely on, spend the time to comment it before you forget. Um, yeah, functions. Everyone know what knows what I mean by functions? Anyone don't know? Doesn't know? Okay, so okay, you guys know that it's important. And documenting your functions. Okay, so let's let's look at an example. So one of the functions I remember yesterday that was used was this guy. So to do cross validation, you have to like split the data. So sometimes it's easy, like if you have eight subjects, you might do leave one subject out. So that's really just looping over subjects, no big deal. But in this case, we have uh, 1500 trials. So we could have done something like leave a session out. So it's 750, 750, um, or one run out or something. Um, but in this case, we did random, random, assignment of trials to our folds. So I decided whenever I wrote this function to make a function that did that for me. So one of the ways of using this function was, I want n folds, give me the first one. And I want n folds, give me the second one. So it kind of abstracts away all of the little logic to do that. And that's nice because now this script has been simplified because otherwise we'd have to get like 20 lines of code would actually be inserted right there. And that would make this example script even longer and no one wants to, a longer script. So the benefit is it compresses all the crap that you gotta look at. Um, and so when writing this, like you gotta document it. Like you have to make it super clear what it does, super clear what you need to give it and so on. So if you find yourself writing functions, document it well. And you know exactly how much detail to put in is an open question. You don't want to like duplicate the code into the documentation because that then it'll take your time to read it because you don't, you're not going to remember how to call the function. So you're going to one day you're going to go back and look at the documentation, and that's your time taking up now. So you want to make it as short as possible while still being clear as to how to use it and what it does. Okay, some of this is obvious, but. Um, yeah, and test your functions. So I mean, what I do typically is at least put one example of how to use a function so that, you know, if you're curious, you can just do it. But this is not great. Like this doesn't test anything. Like it's just using it, but there's no guarantee it's right. So a better example would have actually put in an example where you know what the right, right answer is and actually confirm that it's right. Okay. Uh, another thing when you're designing code, we kind of went over this. You don't have to make perfect code if it's quick and dirty analyses. Just, in fact, oftentimes I explore data, and you know I did that in some of the example scripts. I was like going line by line, but then I was like showing some concept of like the the FS average ball. Like I didn't write type those into a separate file and like comment it. I just like directly did it, and that's totally fine, right? And but what you might want to do, and that's what I mentioned here, is take screenshots. Like, I should have took a screenshot of the FS average ball so that you know one day I might want to refer to it. Um, and so often, and I'll just show you an example. I do that, you know, my own stuff. So I have a folder on my computer that I don't. It's com it's completely unorganized. It's not like this figure came from this code. I don't even have the code that made it. But like I save little examples. So here's the hippocampus. And I, I was just playing around one day and I saw it. And like here's this little volume render of the. Visual Sulk Atlas. I mean, I could recreate this because I know how to use ITK Snap, but it's just nice having this around. Um, you know, so just take a screenshot if you're just playing around and and you know, so various plots of data that I was looking at and trying to debug. It's fast. Just Shift Command Three on your computer if it's a Mac. <laughs> There's probably equivalent on the Windows. Um, and one last one here is whether your script should be completely automatic or not. And what I mean is like, you open the script and you click play, which is what these scripts are. So on the one hand, it's nice if it's like that, right? It does everything. It starts from scratch, loads in either data or pre-processed data or whatever, does something with the data, maybe saves the results, and then probably makes a figure. 
So that's an ideal, and you know, often we can achieve that. But as we were saying earlier, probably not from the raw data. If you're talking about fMRI data, there's no way you're gonna just. Although, if I mean, for pre, right? If we can divide the line of pre-processing, it's nice to have a pre-processing thing that just you click and it goes. But you probably want to save that, and then from then on, you might want to achieve a script that just you hit play and it actually does serious analysis and generates a result. But even then, once you deal with big data, serious analysis might take a lot of time, just like pre-processing. Like this MVPA thing, if you did it at scale, all eight subjects, all 40 or 30 sessions, that is, you know, will take hours. So you do, for yourself, you're not gonna, you probably want to like do the MVP analysis and save that and then have a script that click play and make some figures, right? Load in kind of the raw percent correct, do some basic like t-tests or whatever and generate some brain maps. So that's nice as a playable script because that is easy. That'll take like a minute to rerun. So you have to decide for yourself like where to put stop points. On the other hand, some things um, you can't make automatic, like defining ROIs. I take it back. You can think of a procedure to make that automatic, yes, but um, not everything is always automatic. Like GUIs, like exploring data in ITK snap, that's not automatic. Um, anyway, so not everything can be automa automatized. Um, so that's just something to think about. Okay, let's talk about safe programming. Or let me stop for a minute before we talk about safe programming. Raise your hand if you know what I mean by safe programming. A few. <laughs> I guess you have to read my mind. It, I mean, this is a common term, I think. I don't think I've made this up. Yeah, I didn't make this up. Although there is actually different definitions of safe programming. Okay. Um, basically, oh right, so this is my metaphor. Code should be ideally like almost m m robotic. Indented, commented, very clear, very structured, well-named, got smooth lines, you know, versus this, this thing. So I don't know if your code looks like that or that, but. Uh, you probably want this type of code. So um, I think you can boil it down to asserts and queries. Aside from like making, you know, indentation and that type of stuff, which is kind of obvious, but what does it mean to do more than that for making safe code? Asserts and queries. So first, asserts. So assert is just, I mean, and, and other programming languages have this, but assert means I'm telling you this is true, and if it does, is not true, crash. So assert that it's true, that blah is true, and that's just a line of code. And, it, and then when you run the code, it gets there, it, it d looks at the assert, evaluates it, is it true? And if it's true, it just keeps going. If it's not true, it explodes and crashes. And that's good because you know you control your code. You kind of want it to do a certain thing, and you want to check that it's doing the right thing as you go through. Okay, so and the upshot is you put in all these asserts. The funny thing is, if nothing happens, you're happy, right? So if it runs and it doesn't crash, then you're you feel good. Okay, so there are some examples of this. So. At least in my, what, what in stuff I do, this comes up all the time, like file matching. That's actually a major pain of fMRI. Like you have so many stimuli or runs or volumes or whatever, just getting the file names right and being able to access it is a lot of the work. And so if you're running you know, a lot of subjects or runs, just confirming that you actually found the files is important. So here is an example of, you know, I define some variable called files. It's like a cell array of strings or something just check that it, I got 10. And so if this is true, then nothing happens. If it's false, the code will crash and that's good because otherwise if you didn't have this in, your code would just keep going and it would 
you know, attempt to like maybe load in some data and then you'll get, and then it'll eventually crash potentially, but then it'll be very unclear why it crashed to you. And then you'll be confused. Whereas if it crashes here, you'll realize, oops, I mistyped the file name or oops, the server wasn't mounted or, you know, or oops, there was an extra file in there, or extra run or something, it was a dummy run. And that, oh, that's really bad. Suppose you had a fake run in your folder and it matched like 11, and then maybe you like pulled out the first 10 or something. That's very unsafe because now you got this dummy run and it's gonna go through the analysis and you'll see results that look crappy and then you'll be sad. And then you'll try to debug it and it'll take you a day to figure out what the heck happened. Versus this, I match the files I want, confirm that there are exactly 10. And if that passes, this reduces room, room for failure. Okay, so you can assert that, I don't know, a variable's empty, maybe sometimes that wants to be true. Uh, dimensionality of matrices, I'd say this, is, this should have been the first example. So voxels by trial or something. Confirm that I actually have data that conform to that size or something. So here it's just saying, give me the dimensionality is equal is a thing that spits out logical truth. So it, are the dimensions of data 10 by 200? So assert that that's true. Actually, there's a way to, I, I, I should, mm. so let's just do a quick check. Files is, I don't know, four. Assert that the length of files is four. Okay, nothing happened. But let's say I was looking for five files. It crashes, but that's not actually great. I should actually have a statement here. Whoops. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there you go. So if this line was embedded in some code, the little red text you get in your MATLAB window would be this versus just saying assert failed. That's kind of not super useful. Uh, alternatively, you could have an error statement. Um, so it could be like, if length files, actually there might be a way to call error without, no, 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 okay, yeah. So if length files is not equal to five, you could say, whoops. And this is nicer because it'll actually tell you um, the line of code that that occurred on. So let me just put this in a, in a little file. So analyze my data, analyze. analyze.m, save it on the desktop. Okay, so let's say I was like, okay, let's run my code, make sure I'm in the desktop, great. So analyze. That would be read if I was running in the terminal um, or a, in a, I don't have it open. Let's try this. Sorry, I don't have a GUI open, um, but it would be read. It, you've seen read before, I'm sure, right? So, <laughs> It would be read and it tells me exactly what line it happened on, which is useful. Line two, so you immediately go to line two and you can fix it. So that's another way to practice safe programming. Instead of assert, you explicitly check something and then error out if it fails. Um, other things, you can check that you actually have all valid numbers, no NANDs. So we talked about this briefly. Is finite checks that everything's actually a number. So assert that everything in data, this is makes data on the fly a column vector, you can check each number to be finite and assert that all of them, so that outputs a single number, is true. Um, and so on. Okay, so that's asserts. And I, uh, I looked, I didn't actually use asserts in my scripts, not because I don't like them, but I don't, I never, found a need to do them, aside from one case, there is this, it happened. So there, I kind of don't want to spend time on this because it's kind of weird what I'm doing, this kind of hashing, but uh, basically I was, un I chose to multiply X by a thousand, Y by a hundred, and Z by one, and then I added those up. Uh, Actually, this is, yeah, you should know how matrix multiplication works. So this is N vertices by three. So it's N by three matrix. And I multiplied it by a column vector that's 1,101. So that has the effect of doing a weighted sum. So it's adding 1,000 times the X coordinate, 100 times the Y coordinate, <clears throat> and then one times the Z coordinate. And that makes it a one number. 
I was using this as a hashing mechanism. I just wanted to, to check that it could have been the case that two vertices map to the same number, and I just wanted to make sure that wasn't happening. So I had an assert statement. Assert that the number of unique elements after this funny ha hashing mechanism is exactly the number of vertices that I started with. Anyway, so that's an example of an assert. And it didn't crash, so it must be true. Good. Okay, the other safe programming bit is querying, which is just like looking at data, I guess. So one thing you want to do is maybe, you know, especially of complicated analyses, omit the semicolon and actually look at, at some of the numbers. So here I'm just like, look at the first element without a semicolon. Uh, or you can look at dimensionality of the data. You're loading data, you're computing things. And I'm just curious, what is the size of data? So by omitting the semicolon, okay, what you can do is run your script and then you can like glance at it occasionally and make sure, oh, for the first subject, it got 100 voxels by 80 by 40. That's reasonable. And then the next time, the next subject, it'll just spit out to the command window, the dimensionality. So you can just like monitor the code a little bit. And it's very fast, just like omit the semicolon, no big deal. A more serious query is like write figures out. And I'm a big fan of that. So that means, I have a little example. So stuff can go wrong with fMRI, as you know. Some volumes may be corrupted. The subject may jump out of the scanner or sneeze or something. You know, anything can fail. So it's always good, theoretically, to quality control stuff. So one version of that is as you're analyzing the data, I mean, you could think this applies to pre-processing. It also applies to subsequent analyses. Like, can we at least visually confirm that something was saying about each bit of data. So each subject, each run, I don't know, each trial or each whatever. And just one version of that is take the time to just write out a figure. So here's an example. Um, especially if you're analyzing a lot of data, you don't have time to manually do this. So if you set it up from the get-go, you will at least have these figures on your computer. So this is just, it's an axial slice, you probably can tell. Um, and it's just one figure for each run. So just the fact that these all look pretty similar already gives me 95 confidence, 95%, 99% confidence that you know there were there wasn't some major fault in each in any given run. So this is run one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You know, and this also checks like did your subject fall asleep? I mean, you should probably have a separate check if you analyze the behavioral data to, to know that. But this is from the fMRI point of view. I mean. I, the pattern of brightness was very similar across the run. Some runs were worse than others. Maybe this one, this was run three, whatever. But I can still tell that things are sane. I mean, this also checks other things like motion correction. Like one run wasn't like completely crazy. So just by taking the time to write out a figure that had access to each component of your data set, you already know a lot about safety. Again, this is trying to prevent the case of, oh, I ran my experiment, I analyzed it, and like nothing worked. Well, there's many things that could have went wrong. Maybe, maybe the data was crap to start with, maybe the subject fell asleep, maybe there was a corruption in the pre-processing step. But if you write out a figure, you can kind of pinpoint where that happened. Um, and that's, and you can also write out text. So I do this, for example, like, we're just writing out the file names that you encounter. So this is kind of like checking that you got enough files, but complementary to that is for each file that you process, just like f print that out to the command line or f print it to a file, just so you can very quickly check the log. Oh yeah, it did subject one, it found 10 runs, did subject two, found 10 runs, and then, that, and you can check that very quickly. Okay. Um, any questions on asserts and queries? I'd say, I mean, this has nothing to do with big data. This is just good, 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 good practice. Okay, moving on. And actually a lot of, I mean, almost all of this is not MATLAB specific. It's just good for whatever you do. Shell scripting, R, Python. Um, 
Although I, I don't know shell scripting. I wonder if, I assume it's applicable. Okay, um, correctness. This one's a hard one. And I think this is the last major slide. So this is good because it, there are lots of bonus lectures we could go through or, or discussion. Um, well, if you practice safe programming, you're more likely to have correct code. Okay, eyeballing code. This is not. This is definitely not foolproof. But if you are a really good programmer, staring at code, it's like proofreading your paper. Just stare at it and think about it, and think about whether you should include more safe programming. Like uh, I should probably assert that that's true, or um, I should probably check the dimensionality of that matrix is actually ten or one. You know, things like that. Uh, we talked about this already. Segment your code into different steps. It's easy to check 100 lines of code. It's not easy to check thousands of lines of code. Like that's crazy. And then in some sense, that's why you write functions. You spend the hour, validate that function, and then never check it again. Okay. Um, ooh, let's do this. Peep. Okay. <laughs> we talked about the profiler. Anyone know about DB stepping? Yeah, yeah, db stop, db set, yeah, a few people. Yeah, we should just quickly give an example. Um, so, I mean, we all know how to like look at a script and maybe go line by line, and then if there's a for loop, like set, I was doing this the other day, like set the indexing variable to one and like evaluate, evaluate. So it's kind of like that, but better. Um, clear all. So let's say we like, Let's do the behavioral data. So um, DB means debug. So there are a couple ways to do it. There's DB stop, DB step. Uh, I refer you to MATLAB's manual, but I'll just do it. So I'm gonna DB stop in the behavioral data script. So it basically means whenever, in a, whenever you run code that eventually runs that thing, it will stop at that point. Okay, so here I'm just gonna call it directly. So it's gonna stop immediately. So it brings up this little circle. So the circle is your friend because it stops and allows you to like check, right? The goal here is checking correctness. Well, one way to check correctness is check every single line of code as it gets run. Okay, so it stopped and it stopped right there, which is the beginning of the script. It's not, it doesn't care about the comments, right? These percent signs, it just ignores them. Okay, so what's happening is that arrow is stopped at that line and MATLAB's telling you, I'm about to execute this line. And it's not gonna go until you allow it to go. So basically we just keep stepping. Step means just go one line. So I know that line's gonna work. Like I can vet that code in my head, easy. All right, now it's stopping at the for loop. So it's like, I'm about to do the first iteration. Here we go. So as soon as I hit step, it does it, and we can do things like check it. Oh, is subject index actually one? Good. Okay, this file name, let's run that line. I, and you know, you can check that file zero thing. Is it true? Uh, that looks about right, great. And then we can run the next line, import data file zero. And then we can, come on. Who knew behavioral data can be big? Okay, so it just ran that line, took a few seconds, and now I can query it. And actually, I can do things like I can plot the data. You know, it's waiting to go on, but I can actually manipulate variables and do stuff in the workspace. Um, I don't know, column nine probably has something interesting. So if I'm, again, if I'm debugging or sanity checking my code, this is probably correct, I chose the wrong column. But um, the point is, you go along my line and you, you know what the code is trying to do, so you can check and plot things and make sure things look okay. Like, is that actually a brain? Is that actually, do, are there actually finite values in this variable? And you can do all sorts of things. And then when you're happy, you just keep going. So you step, and you step, and you step. Now it's going to subject two, so it's gonna do that. And now I'm happy that this for loop is correct, let's say. But I don't wanna keep clicking step, so I'm just gonna put a new breakpoint. And instead of stepping, I'm just gonna say continue, just go. Okay, so then it's going, and Oh, there you go, it's done. I don't know why that took so long for that one subject. Um, but look at the arrow, it's now done with that little first load thing. 
And I should, and now I can do some checks. Let's check the data, the data. So I have eight subjects and immediately I can verify, oh, this, I know the number of trials is 30,000. That looks good. I have 19 columns. That looks good. You know, these aren't like empty. Like maybe there was a file error or something went wrong. Like I immediately can know that, but everything looks good. Then I can keep going. Step the next line, step, step, step. Or another use is, let's say you run a large analysis script and it crashes, like indexing failed, blah, 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 very common error. Well, it tells you what line it died on. So you wouldn't DB stop the first script and step a thousand times to get to the point where it crashed. You just put a little stop point because you know where it crashed and then you stop it there and then you run the script and then it'll go and then it'll pull up a window when it gets there and allow you to look at what's going on. So there's an easy way to do that actually. Um, you just say db stop if error. In fact, maybe I'll just demonstrate that. Um, let me remove these stop points. I just clicked on the little friendly red circle. Uh, and then I'm gonna make my code bad. Um, so let's put in an error here like, There are not 50 columns in this thing. I'm gonna mistype 50. And I'm gonna save this. And I'm gonna db stop if error. So you just issue it from the command line. And it, it's like a state variable. If you quit MATLAB, it'll reset. So right now I'm turning on this little db stop thing. All right, now I'm gonna run my script. Sorry, one last command. So I remember I db stopped the script. I have to db clear all. So like get rid of all the circles, like start fresh. So clear all the breakpoints and then issue db stop if error. All right, whoops, good. Now let's run our little behavioral script. So it's gotta do the load, but what it's gonna do is crash. Oh, there you go, crash. But the beauty is we're, we're, not, we're still running it actually. Like it knew it was about to crash, but it didn't really crash because it brought us to that point. As you can see, there's an arrow right there. And it tells us the error statement. Index in position two exceeds array bounds. Must not exceed 19. Oh, that's nice. Um, okay, so this kind of diagnosed the problem for us. We kind of already know, oh, whoops, 50 is not right. Um, but, you know, at, we can do things like, oh, what was subject index? Oh, it was, it was the first one that crashed on. Hmm. And like, what's the contents of data? Oh, that looks good. So we can do all these queries and looks at it and try to figure out why it was crashing. And then let's say we fix it, then we essentially just say db quit, db clear all, and then fix the problem, undo that, save it, and then we're good to go. And then maybe just clear all and run it again. Okay. Any questions on db stop, db step, step? So you could even think you should by default maybe do db stop if error. Just turn that on so that if your code crashes, uh, you can just go look at what's going on. Especially, well, yeah, especially for a big inexpensive analysis. If you're running a thing that might take an hour, <laughs> uh, you might want to turn that on. Uh, how else to know that your code is correct? Well, unit tests make a data set, know what the right answer is, and test it. Um, have someone look at your code. Code review is like a thing for programming types where you like sit in the room and look at code and talk about it. It's hard because it takes time. And maybe one last idea, <laughs> and this almost never happens. Although th that preprint kind of gets at this of like, Read a paper, read the now method section, now implement it and run it on their data. Do you get the same answer? That's one way to check correctness. Um, but it again, costs a lot of time. Um, how much do you do code review? Because I, I always think that I should be doing it, but I always actively do it. 
student has a problem with that yet. Yeah, same. I don't currently incorporate that into every day. Um, that's it for coding issues. Let me pause one minute for it to soak in. Anyone have any discussion points? Okay, so um, my suggestion.